Welcome to Strip Cover Lit. I'm Adrian Fort. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we are here today with a book review of Thomas Harris's Hannibal. Now, this is going to be a little different from our writer's review, isn't it, Adrian? This is going to be more book-focused and not uh, writing-focused? Yeah, it, it'll be basically like a movie review. A movie review for a book. For a book. So, a book review, if you right. will. But what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, you don't watch a movie review and expect a lesson on how movies are made. Expect people talking about how the scene transitions looked necessarily exactly okay uh, fair warning though if you have not read Hannibal yet pause it go to your local library pick it up this is gonna spoil the novel for you it's uh, like a 30 minute read <laughs> a little more than 30 minutes oh. but well, I don't know how long it took you but I have no life I know anyway uh, what, what would you like to say about Hannibal first and foremost the first thing that sticks out to me um, upon rereading Hannibal after having read a lot in between is just how badly Dan Brown wants to be Thomas Harris. What do you mean by that? I, I, I like Dan Brown. I'm okay with Dan Brown. You're okay with Dan Brown? I'm okay with Dan Brown. Uh, maybe. Um, hold on. Get out. <laughs> uh, maybe I just like, uh, is it Tom Hanks who was in The Da Vinci Code? Yeah. Uh, maybe I just like Tom Hanks. So you, didn't, you haven't read Dan Brown? I have read The Da Vinci Code. I've also read Angels and Demons. I have not read The Lost Symbol, I believe the third one is. I'm not... Yeah, there's... He's... He, yeah. Um, he's a bad writer. Okay. Um, what he does... The thing that makes me say that about this novel is that some of... Some of this... Some of these characters uh, flirt with cartoonish. Whereas in other Dan Brown, uh, other Thomas Harris novels, they don't. And upon picking up a Dan Brown novel, it feels like you're reading a cartoon version of a comic book that has been translated into words. Okay. So that's where I stand with this. I mean, I, I think there are some redeeming qualities to the characters that are, where they're not 100% cartoonish. In here? In here, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, Hannibal, absolutely, Hannibal. absolutely. Um, now, the Dan Brown will save that for another time. Maybe, I don't uh, know do but... myself again. <laughs> I think the, uh, the characters, uh, the female characters especially, there's a lot of uh, a sense of feminism and strength that Harris bestows upon these female, female characters. Uh, it's very redeeming. Uh, it makes them a good character. Um, you disagree? I, well, I think the thing... The, the, there are two main female characters in here. Okay. Uh, there's Clarice, obviously, and there's Margot. Okay. Margot is a bodybuilder. Clarice um, is better at the manly stuff than the men. So he has not built strong female characters. He has ripped women of their gender. Oh, what do you think about uh, Misha, Hannibal's sister? Uh, the concept behind her having so much power over Lecter himself that essentially his entire being has been forged around her. Uh, what he witnessed happen to her has created the monster that is Hannibal Lecter. Uh, there's so much strength behind that female character through that. Well, I think there that what you're doing, though, is, is you are representing a family member as a female as opposed to a female as a family member. The, the power that Misha has over Hannibal is that she was his sister, not that she was a female. Um, and I, I think that when you get into any of that period, what you're doing is really, really, you're assigning gender as opposed to exploring the gender roles. So he, Harris has taken the strong characters in the novel Besides, I mean, obviously Hannibal, who's, obviously. who's meta god, but um, he's taken these strong characters in the novel and assigned them the gender of female. Whereas, isn't isn't feminist okay? So feminism is saying that there's no difference between the genders. Women are equal to men. Okay. Feminist critique explores the difference 
in genders as represented through literature. Um, in this novel, there's very little of that exploration going on. It's saying, okay, so Clarice is a woman. Yeah, sure, fine. But like, she's totally better at the dude stuff than the dudes. I like to imagine Thomas Harris actually sounds exactly like that. No uh, one, unfortunately, has any idea what Thomas Harris sounds like because he hasn't done an interview since 1970. Which is terribly unfortunate. Thomas Harris, if you stumble upon this, we can set up a third chair here. We would love to have you. I don't think that's a possibility. He's a bit of a recluse, if I understand. I certainly hope it is. I'd never thought of that. I mean, it'd be wonderful. Watching. We're waiting for you, Tom. I, I, I imagine that at this point you have nothing to do but be on YouTube. <laughs> right? I, well, I, I don't know. I don't know. He hasn't, that. hasn't written a novel since Hannibal Rising, I don't think. I don't believe he has, nor has he spoke to anyone. I believe his publications go back to 1974 with Black Sunday, and he's written five or six novels? I, again, I'm just concerned, as always, why you know that little factoid. But I am, I am Wikipedia. You are Wikipedia. You are the mountain. In person, you? I am the mountain. You are the mountain. <laughs> anyway, I have to get back on track here. Uh, how did you feel about uh, the, the ending to Hannibal? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure what ending you mean. There are five stories going on. Okay. Um, in, in fact, let, let me jump to that. There are five stories going on. There's Starling's story, Mason's story, Potsy's story, Lecter's story, and Barney's story. Um, Starling's story goes from forced to boring to good. Mason's from good to try hard. Or st Mason's story actually goes from try hard to cartoonish to necessary, merely necessary, never compelling. Potsy's story is the meat of this novel. Um, I hope I'm saying that right, Potsy. Now let's go with Potsy, Potsy pizza. That sounds right, Potsy. Um, uh, Lecter's story, though it has its faults, is the most interesting, but it rarely travels past interesting. Um, Bar Barney's story goes from forced to satire to happily ever after. So the the novel actually ends with Barney. Is it that does. the ending you're speaking about? I, yes and no. I think looking from the Clarice Lecter storyline, which I think was meant to be the overall main storyline to it, though I do agree the Potsy part is that, that that's the novel. That's right. the good part. Right. Uh, but with Clarice and Lecter, the whole brainwashing thing, uh, where he is trying to make her become his sister Misha, I, it's a little far-fetched for me. I don't think a highly trained FBI agent who's obviously got, oh yes, who has obviously gone through rigorous training for something like this would submit so easily and just be like, well, I'm Misha now. And then go far as far as to fall in love with Lecter. At the ending of the novel, we see them at the opera. And it's just so mundane. It's just like a husband and wife, they're going out on the town for the night. They're no longer Lecter and Starling. They've, in a sense, kind of brainwashed each other. Well, no, I, I don't think there was any brainwashing going on. I think that what happened was these two characters realized that the other was necessary in their life. Starling needed the older male figure that her father had had. had her, when her father died, she was void of that since then, right? Um, and that was, that was, it, it is perfect. It's actually perfect <laughs> because she had been devoid of that male role, which led to her being in, a, in, in foster care, right? From Signs of the Lambs. I believe when so. She I actually, think her, her uncle raised her or something like something that. Something like that. Um, so she ran away because of the lambs, right? Well, she wouldn't have been there had her father still been around. Okay. Um, I think that's how that goes. That was three novels ago. It's I can't, been a while. Um, so she, she needed that. That's one of the things that necessitated the title for the first novel. Okay. Okay. Hannibal, titled Hannibal, is about Hannibal Lecter. Um, who is devoid of his younger sister, a younger woman, um, someone that, that, and I know I just got away from the, the whole feminist argument, yes. but that void 
was for a younger woman. So this whole time, starting with the Silence of the Lambs, there's been this attraction between the two that was necessary. And they ended up this way together simply by going through the motions. You think so? Yes. So what you're telling me is this entire, uh, let's call it a trilogy, trilogy. we'll keep out Hannibal, Hannibal Rising. Rising. Okay. It's trash. Um, well, I, we haven't read it, but we can only assume. We can assume. It's we just, can't assume. That's not fair to Thomas Harris. Anyway, I'm sorry. Go on. Okay. Uh, what you're saying is this entire trilogy is the chase. Yeah. And we're reading a romance novel, not a horror novel. That might be too far, but only for my dignity's sake. That is exactly what this is. It is the chase. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure that I can buy it 100%. Hold on. I'm still a little depressed that I just read three romance novels, but go on. <laughs> You'll move up in life. This will be good for you. We'll work your way through that emotional response. I, I sure hope so. Uh, <laughs> um, let, let's talk about uh, the movie, Silence of the Lambs. Uh, the character, Hannibal Lecter, and in my opinion, the influence that comes from Anthony Hopkins' performance as Hannibal. I feel like in this novel, I'm no longer reading the original Hannibal that was from Silence of the Lambs. I'm reading Anthony Hopkins performing as Hannibal. There's just almost so much fan service, especially, I think you mentioned at one point, uh, Barney being a fan service character. Barney's, Barney's appearance in this is strictly fan service, I feel. And uh, fan service from the movies, nonetheless. Yes. Um, in fact, there's a scene where Barney's prized possession from his memorabilia of Hannibal, which, I mean, I think is a, a bit movieish in and of itself that you're keeping these things from Hannibal, but is the mask that he wore during trans that Hannibal wore during transportation. I feel like that would not have even been an issue without the movie. The mask was such a big deal in the movie, whereas in the book it was just sort of mentioned. Um, but it was such a big deal in the book, I think, simply because it became so iconic, not only of the movie, but of the character. People associate Hannibal with that mask. You see the mask by itself you think of the character. So can we really fault Harris for trying to write in the style of the film? I mean, all in all, he's doing what he set out to accomplish. He wrote an entertaining novel. But as a reader, do we, do we care about the fact that we're losing characters to actors? I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. I think Anthony Hopkins is the perfect Hannibal Lecter, and I've said that time and time again. But I want to read about Hannibal Lecter. If I wanted to read about Anthony Hopkins, I'd go read about Anthony Hopkins. Right. Well, it's, 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 it's an extreme case, an extreme study in that symbiotic nature of a piece of literature in any form that was taken from another form, right? Um, the, the big thing with Marvel Comics yes. that aren't strict adaptations of or the, the movies aren't strict adaptations from the comic books. So there is that symbiotic relationship. And now the comics are being informed by the movies. Some of yes. the characters um, both look more like the actors and uh, the storylines seem to stem from the, the movies. So, And maybe that's just a normal evolution, a progress, because this is really the first generation of literature you could say, that has had such a major impact on film. Well, I don't know about that. I think that, I, I think that this is the first generation of literature that has, such, has had such an impact from film. From film. I, I'd agree with that one for sure. And it may be, like I said, this is just a normal evolution, and we're getting away from the rigid literature and the rigid film, and it's just becoming one entity of entertainment. I mean, I, I think there is some to lose in both regards, but some to gain as well. Right, and, and I think, I, I don't think that literature has suffered from the mass appeal of movies. Twilight. That's not fair. Garbage has existed forever, right? Okay. Um, what I mean is that 
For, for example, Brett Easton Ellis, would you give me that? Uh, Brett name? Easton Ellis. Yes, right there, right second to, that's not Brett Easton, it says Brett Easton Ellis, right? Oh, on I can't right. read from okay. that angle, okay. This guy, Brett Easton Ellis, is an extreme example of the study that goes, that a novel is. The experience of a novel is being in someone's head. Um, but he's, he writes in a very cinematic fashion. Okay. Everything that happens, you see. Thomas Harris, despite the fact that Brett Easton Ellis writes first person, right, writes first person but in a very cinematic fashion. Thomas Harris writes third person in a very cinematic fashion. Okay, yes. Um, but that third person from a very cinematic fashion feels like watching a movie. The first person, very cinematic fashion, feels like being the character. Alrighty. So I, I, I don't know, that, I, I think that art begets art, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at, um, for example, the Ninja Turtles, right? Yes. The artists that they are named after, their lives all intersected, okay? Those are four of the greatest artists in history. Yes. Art pops up that way. Art inspires art. Art begets art. Um, I look at the lost generation of uh, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, right. Gertrude Stein. Right. All hung out, all, all did great things. So I think that art informing art can only improve art. Fair enough. Um, overall, though, I, I think this, this novel left me satiated, but you said you brought up the ending. And for me, <laughs> the ending was not... Hannibal and Clarice coming together, the ending was Barney watching the two of them in an opera. And the ending was absolutely terrible, in my opinion. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it was building up to just what would be a, a brilliant cliffhanger. You know, they're still out there. They could be anywhere. They could be at the opera. But it just didn't feel that way in it, the end. It just, just felt like a husband and a wife going out on the town for the night. It felt very happily ever after, am I it wrong? It did, because it's a romance novel. And who wants to look at a Silence of the Lambs trilogy as a happily ever after trilogy? I mean, if you look back at Silence of the Lambs even, who at that point would say, Hannibal Lecter, that's a good looking guy. I'd like to go to the opera with him. Yeah, um, but it happened. It did, and it's terrible. It's absolutely horrible. Um, and that, that brings me back to my first point, that this this is not... Red Dragon, this is not yes. Silence of the Lambs. But it's a good novel. It's worth reading. I, I will give that. Anything is worth reading. Good or bad, it is always worth reading. It's always worth reading. This was an enjoyable read. Let me I put it that way. Um, so I, I hate to harp on it too much. It, it also, uh, since we're bringing up the art and influencing art, Thomas Harris has always danced the line between literature and pop novel, much in the way that Dashiell Hammett did before him. Um, there are parts of this novel which are not dance, but a drunken stumbling after last call, just looking to take someone home at the end of the night. That's that's, and on on the pop side of things, um, a lot of this novel does not feel disciplined. Okay. Um, in, in fact, there's there's a where is it? Is it as good as Red Dragon and Silence of the Lambs? No. This one is better. That's, that's on the cover. Guess who said it? Who said that? Stephen King. You know why Stephen King said that? Because this does not, th this feels very much like Silence of the Lambs and The Shining had a baby. Uh, yeah, I, I, reading it makes sense. I, the, it, this has the overtones of Silence of the Lambs and the undertones of The Shining. Um, now, would you say that it's possible that The Shining has actually influenced Harris? Because I do believe it came out well before uh, right, Hannibal, yeah. even well before Silence of the Lambs. I think so, yeah. Uh, could that have been an, an influence on Harris? And is that a bad thing to take influence from other authors? No, it's not. I don't think so. It's not a bad thing at all, especially, I mean, if you're going to take influence from someone, let it be someone who's sold more books than God. Exactly. And even better that he's still alive to praise your front cover. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Um, who else gets quotes from Stephen King on their cover? I, right? I hope one day that's, I don't even care what it says. This is a book, Stephen King. Right, right. I don't, I'll just take random Stephen King quotes 
quotes and put them on the cover. It doesn't matter what he's talking about. I just want an excerpt from Dance Macabre on there. It's wonderful. Um, I, I think regardless of a reading like The Shining or the cinematic appeal, overall I feel it was a little flat. I, it was an enjoyable read. The law enforcement push at the beginning with Starling sold me 100%. Having worked in law enforcement, that was big to me. That immediately sold me that media turn. It feels like Harris 100% knew what he was talking about for that, and I loved it. After that, though, once we get to Posse, things start picking up, and then we're done. And we just flatline the rest of the way all the way to the opera. Which brings me to a point, I, I for me, that the beginning of this novel felt forced. It felt different than the rest. It felt like it was written different than the mm -hmm. rest. For me, it felt like, after, after reading the whole thing, it felt like th the first Starling part was tacked on later, where he realized, yeah, I gotta bring Starling back. Uh, yeah. Let me write the rest of the novel, I'll tack it on. Yeah. Um, but it, it does, that's, the, the connection between media and law enforcement is in all three of the novels. Um, I, I, obviously, I don't know about Hannibal Rising. I haven't read that yet, but it is interesting that it that is such a pervasive note through all of them. I think even more so, it's such a testament that it, it really has stood the test of time. I mean, this came out fairly recently, as far as literature goes, uh, but that's still an issue that we're dealing with today: is the media's interpretation of law enforcement, and I think Harris just brilliantly captures it. And uh, maybe it's different if you work in the media business, but working in law enforcement, that sold this for me. That made me want to trust Harris and believe Harris and get along for this ride and all the way to the end where, you know, the car derailed and we're at the opera. Right. It's, it's all over when the fat lady sings. It's all over when the fat lady sings. Um, another thing that, that brings up for me is, is wondering, you, you know, you said uh, media and law enforcement. Look at media and... Um, literature. Mm -hmm. What was the first movie that you saw that had cell phones in it? I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, actually. Right. But there was a point when it happened. Yes. What was the first movie you saw where someone mentioned Twitter, mentioned Facebook, mentioned YouTube? It's strange the way that those things... How do those things work their way into literature, right? Yeah. Like, like at what point... And, and when they work their way in, how do they become plot devices? Um, which is, has nothing to do with Hannibal. It's just something I just thought of. So <laughs> well, yeah, it's a testament to literature and reading as a whole, really, because this is an entity that is continuously growing. And, and I think It is. It's evolving. It's dangerous to run the risk of saying, this is literature, this is good writing. You should be willing to take a risk on something else. I mean, this is a very, like you said, a pop-lit book. But from a horror aspect, there's a lot of good elements from it. It may be a little bit different than the norm. From a romance aspect, this is off the wall different from the norm, but it still reads as a romance. Well, and, and, and upon finishing this novel, what genre would you have placed it in? I think of the... Not, not now. Not, okay. not now, but upon finishing it. Upon finishing it. While you, or, or while you were in the midst of reading it. I would say pop lit. I that is not a genre. That's not a genre. You not want me really. To clarify. I, yeah, like horror is pop lit. I mean, I think as soon as Hannibal is first kill in the novel, it's horror. Even further back from that, uh, the, the dealings with uh, I cannot remember the drug dealing woman's name in the beginning of the novel. Esmeral as es something. It's gone. Be it's beyond me. The. Description of graphic violence is a huge plot point to horror. Uh, the so would you consider Fight Club horror? No, I wouldn't. See, I don't know how to define it. Then. That that and for me, that is one of the hallmarks that brings something to literature, mm -hmm. right? When you have no other place to shine the light, it becomes ah uh, literature. This doesn't feel like literature though. There are parts of this that, that are very literature. Thomas Harris has the literature bone, um, but this isn't literature, right? So what is it? I mean, that's the question. And maybe uh, someone out there could help us. What tell us. is this? You tell us. 
that's what I've got for Thomas Harris's Hannibal. Me too. And that's what I'm thinking. I, please feel free to comment on this. Let us know what you're thinking about Thomas Harris, about Hannibal, about horror and romance. About what we should read next. Uh, about how wonderful I look today compared to Adrian. Anything you'd like to tell us. Or if you even enjoy the way that hipsters look. Make sure you follow us on Twitter, at Stripped Cover. Make sure you follow us on Facebook. And please subscribe to the YouTube channel and keep this going. Give us a like.